opportunity to be here. And thanks to my friends from Singfell and Optus for allowing me the opportunity. I, I think if we're going to click over into slides, and what I'll do is I'll share some of the perspectives of what it is that we're working on. And our goal is not to say this is the right way or the best way. We're just saying this is what we believe is important for us. And I speak in the first person in terms of us because I've lived in Singapore now coming up on 15 years this summer. And although I don't look <coughs> like I belong in Singapore government, I am actually a, a part of Singapore government's infrastructure. And so it's an opportunity to share what it is that we're working on. So from that perspective, I'm just going to outline what it is, why, what we believe are some next steps for us, and ideally, this will also give us a platform in which we can then explore later areas of mutual interest and cooperation so that we can work together and ideally create some exciting things together. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So here's our beauty shot. We're proud of Singapore, and so we like to say a smart nation. And what I'll do is I'll differentiate at the beginning. We don't say nation simply because it's a different twist on city. What we are aspiring to do, we believe, is more holistic across a number of different areas of government and industry and universities. And so we want it to be something which is more inclusive. And at the same time, because we are a particular size, we talk about nation because that's how we describe ourselves. So it's not smart city with a twist. We do believe it's something that's important and different. Here's why we're working on it. There are two trends that we think are important for us to confront. And the reason that we're working on these is not because they're the only two. It's because they affect all of us. All of us meaning any country in the world with just a very, very few minor exceptions. One, urban density. Because we are a densely populated island, and here's a little comparison of why. So it's not about the numbers specifically. It's more the idea that Asia continues to grow in terms of population and density. Clearly, there's big trends in China and in India and other countries. So our goal is really to say this is an issue that affects everyone. And this is something that if we work on it, there's great opportunities, commercial opportunities, important social opportunities. Here's a little bit about how we take a look at the numbers. When we think of land mass, because Singapore is land constrained, we think of it as a very densely populated place with nowhere else to go. So although Australia has a lot of coastal cities, clearly, although whether it's easy or less easy to be somewhere else, there is land. In the United States, clearly, there's a lot of major cities. There's also a lot of land, same in the UK. For Singapore, we have what we have. And so we have 8,000 people per square kilometer. And that means we have to think about these issues in a very specific way. Here's the other major trend that affects all of us, aging population. So the fact that we're all getting older, and the good news or bad news, depending on your perspective, is that with the advances of medical care and the technology and so on and so on, normally in history, until maybe just 100 years ago, the first thing that aff uh, afflicted you, that caused you to be ill, was often the thing that went on to kill you. Whereas now, people live years with chronic conditions, and in some cases, two or three chronic conditions that all have to be managed. So the reality is, we're all living longer, and in a lot of countries, the birth rate is slowing. And so for the first time in human history, over the next few decades, there will be more people above the age of 65 than below the age of five. And so that changes a lot of things. Here's what's happening for us. We have roughly one in nine citizens above the age of 65. So let's just use that as the benchmark. That's going to triple in the next 15 years. So again, we have a very significant growth, as do many countries. So the reason that I share these is urban density and aging population are things that we are confronting. And therefore, we need to work on them with some urgency. But they are also things that other cities, other governments, other nations are confronting. So, one of the things as we dug into this and looked at it using a lot of data is that basically if you are above the age of 65 and are admitted to hospital, the data shows that you will stay one third longer than someone who is slightly younger. The reason that's important is back to the previous slide. Because population is aging and because this is going to be a tripling, 
we know that the implication on hospitals will be significant. So as we dig into some of the implications, here's some of the things that we're looking at now. Health. We know that we are building hospital beds as quickly as is practical. Back to the earlier point. Land constraint <coughs> means that we cannot build as many hospitals as we might prefer. At the same time, even if we could build more hospitals, there's a shortage of qualified caregivers that would staff those hospitals. So now we have a very significant and practical problem, which is yes, we're building more hospital beds, but we also know that there is a chronic care load that we have to think through. And this is clearly about a third of the care load in Singapore. And based on what we've learned about other markets, it's not terribly dissimilar. So more or less in other countries, this type of these three conditions generally being the ongoing chronic care load in a hospital infrastructure is something that has to be managed. And so the more we can offload, to use the expression, some of that from the hospital and leave the hospital more for emergency care or acute care, the better. So what we've done, what we've done is taken a look and said the slope of supply of beds is clearly below the slope of demand. So as we look forward into the future years, we can see that this gap increases. And so therefore, the obvious implication is, what do we do with technology in order to provide care for citizens of different ages with different medical needs outside the hospital? So that's what we're working on. We've also tried to dig in using some different experiments that have been run together with the Ministry of Health. What's causing readmission? Why is it that a patient is discharged and then comes back within a few days or a week. And so there's been some experimentation. We're simply the guys that are supporting the technology. The Ministry of Health is supporting, of course, the front end in terms of care. And what we're trying to do is assess in what way can titration of medicine or adjustment of uh, dosages of medicine earlier in the cycle, once the patient is discharged, help make sure he or she does not have to come back. So patient compliance sticking with the care regime, making sure that they do what they're supposed to do, and there are more and more IoT-related capabilities in which this is something that we can work on. So there's a group, there's a small company called Proteus Health, which is working on having an ingestible sensor less than the size of a grain of rice, which has transmission capability, and you would ingest together with your daily meds, because it would be a part of the pill, and then with an external patch, it says the medicine's on board, you are doing what you're supposed to do. Importantly, it has data for you and for your caregiver that knows compliance is there. So things such as antibiotic resistant disease, which is a problem in parts of Southeast Asia where people drop out of their program too early and then the disease comes back in a way that mutates. So these are real issues that run outside the current ability to provide superior care and Singapore wants to be a leader in some of these areas. So how do we make sure that we are looking at readmissions and trying to lower the rate of readmissions? And clearly it's a small subsection that comes back most of the time. If we can improve that, it makes a big difference. So based on some of the prototypes that we were running together with the Ministry of Health, we were able to see a 300% or 3x decline where we cut very significantly the amount of patients coming back when we didn't need them to. Those that needed to, did. Those that did not were able to stay home. That's a big difference in terms of the hospital bed shortage and obviously quality of life for citizens. Mobility is another one. When we take a look, this is a real scenario. We have basically 012 to 13 data to hand, so that's what I'm using. But in a nutshell, we only added 1% of additional roadway to what's available in <coughs> Singapore in the most recent surveys or most recent data. That means we're simply not building more road because of the same issue, land constraint. And so it's expensive, it's disruptive, there just isn't enough space. So we only added 1%, but clearly more and more traffic, clearly more and more people wanting to move around. So what we're trying to do is to say, well, how much is dedicated to roads and how much is dedicated to housing? And so clearly when we have roughly the same amount of surface for housing as we do for roads, we know that we don't want to go and build a lot more roads because that comes at the expense of housing. There's only so much that you can do, so we're into the trades and the priorities. So clearly, what we have to do is make better use of what we have, and so we're taking a look, as you would imagine, 
at autonomous vehicles. We're trying to be better at use of electric vehicles because of the price of cars. We have the ability to think about that easily. So here's the basic challenge we've laid out for ourselves. How do we double the capacity of roads but not actually build anything new? Now clearly, that's not an easy challenge. But the way that we've tried to represent it here with this simple graphic is if a human being has to be X number of meters apart from the other human being, that's a reality. If you put a system in place, then you can have cars operate much, much more densely packed. Now, there's the natural human inclination of saying, that feels scary because I'm not in charge, and how do I know this whole thing works, and what if somebody hacks it? All issues that we're working on. But at the same time, the easy counter argument is, we're all happy to get on a motorway and go 110 or 120 kilometers an hour next to people we've never met, and that's okay. So why is this more scary? So we're trying to think about this in a way that says we simply have to find a way to make what we have more efficient. We don't want to make things wider. We want to try and have them be more densely packed. We can't do that, meaning we humans cannot do that. So what we have to do is say, in what way could we help make that possible through technology? Just like aircraft land more closely together than they did 15 years ago, so we're trying to do the same thing with automobiles. Now, autonomous vehicles, we're experimenting. We have six kilometers of public road in Singapore that we are experimenting this year with how AVs would operate. We're exploring different ways to bring AV technology to bear in Singapore. We've got a lot of research going on. But back to the comment made by Minister and others, it's basically a software engine inside a chassis. And so we're trying to think about how do we use this capability to experiment. So talking with the guys, Mercedes, Audi, BMW, many, many others. Okay, so this is one of the big areas that we're working on. Here's another one. Resources. Now, I share this shot for two reasons. One is I love this part of Singapore because it's beautiful. Number two is it uses a lot of energy. So we had basically a one-third increase over a five-year period in Singapore in the amount of energy consumed. So as the city continues to be more and more beautiful at night, it also consumes a lot of power along the way. So we have to think about how do we manage this reality and how do we use energy more efficiently. So to repeat the previous points, we don't want to build more power generation. What we want to do is use what we have as effectively as we can. And so we're trying to make sure that we are thinking about one of these big concerns. Since Singapore has no fresh water to speak of, it's a tough environment to make sure you get things right. So the original solution was bring water from the next door neighbors, in this Malaysia in this case. Another one has been rainwater recapture, which has continued to be more and more uh, pervasive with reservoirs. There's, of course, desalination. There's recycling. So there's all these different scenarios. And the goal is, how do we make sure that we don't have to buy in water and we can be self-sufficient? That's where we're trying to head. And it's a variety. This is actually a reservoir. So it was seawater not too many years ago on the other side of the barrage, and it's now <coughs> freshwater. So it's part of the recapture and recycle. So what we said was we have to bring all these things together in a way that is different, cohesive, and how does it use the tools and resources that we have. So that's where we said let's bundle this together in something called Smart Nation. Because that gives us a common purpose, and it gives us something that we can focus on. So that's where that originated. Three basic types of innovation that we're pursuing, just to touch on them ever so briefly. Tech is inevitable. Here's one of the things that we're doing now. And back to the idea of lampposts. So we are fans also of using existing infra. This box is a prototype that we have up and operational. It's called an aggregation gateway, or AG. But the whole idea is we have sensors deployed, we have an, an area in Singapore in which we have a 1,000 sensors out, prototyping, testing. And what we do is we have those sensors aggregate back to some areas in which we have fiber backhaul so that we can then connect back to some abilities to capture, utilize that data. So this box I share with you because it's just a way of saying it's real. Right? We're, we've built it. This is actually sort of V3, version 3 of the box. The, the original was refrigerator size. And so what we're trying to do is have power and connectivity so that we can actually have emergency services pull up 
and we have what's called a, a fiber hydrant as opposed to a fire hydrant. If you have emergency <laughs> services come up, they can connect in and they can then <laughs> tap into the bigger brain, the bigger network infrastructure if they're at a site in which they need to have uh, improved communications capability and immediacy. And also get a dashboard of what's happening within that area because they will be able to mainline all of the sensor infrastructure within that zone, for example. So this is something, and we're calling it Smart Nation Platform, which is cellular connectivity, Wi-Fi connectivity. We're trying to make sure that we have a variety of connectivity options available to us, and those aggregate here into this thing that we're calling Platform. Here's some of the ways that we measure ourselves. I won't read through them all, but we have one gigabit connectivity to 95% of the island. So that gives us a great starting point. And then what we need to do now is build on that and improve on that. This little animation, I think, just tries to paint the picture. So the whole idea is we're showing from the individual home, through the housing blocks, into the other parts of the island. And the whole idea here is we want everything and everyone everywhere all the time. So that's basically what we're saying is our direction. Right? That's our goal, is we don't want, to say it in the inverse, we don't want anyone or anything to not have connectivity. So that's an easy thing to say, and it's tremendously difficult to do. It's technology, it's legislation, it's business models, it's the whole gambit. But the basic scenario is, if we can do this, then we can build some amazing things on top. So the goal is not this so that everybody has amazing connectivity to Twitter or any other social media. That's a byproduct. It's if we want to improve healthcare, if we want to improve transportation, if we want to improve energy in the ways that we think are going to be critical, we have to start with this type of connectivity. And so this is what we're trying to achieve. Now think of it as underground. So when you're in the train tunnels, between different stations. We have connectivity that you can enjoy on the platform. But when you're speeding through one of the MRTs or one of the subway tunnels, that's a different problem. When you are in basement three of a building, that's a different problem than basement one. When you're in the lift and you're on the 65th floor of a building and you're going down to B1, that's a different problem to have connectivity throughout that ride. So. There's a whole range of challenges that we're trying to confront to deliver this. Policy. Part of the team that I lead works on spectrum management, so we have to free up spectrum. We've been working a lot on making sure that we have broadcast spectrum freed up where it's underutilized. Now, the additional challenge that we face, which would be different for Australia, is that we have neighbors who also have airwaves that cross over us. So we have our Indonesian neighbors, we have our Malaysian neighbors whose spectrum crosses over us. So it's not as if we can simply carve bandwidth and say that's ours. We also have to be negotiating and reaching bilateral and trilateral <coughs> agreements with the neighbors on spectrum. But we've freed up some spectrum in order to make sure that we can reutilize <coughs> what is underutilized. And the really cool thing that we're trying to think about, and we'd love to work with Australia in terms of innovation, is where we have something such as more and more time slicing of that spectrum. So if something is underutilized for a day, or an hour, or a minute, and that can be reallocated dynamically for other use cases. So the ability to hop and move across different bands without disruption is something that we would love to continue to work on. Clearly open data, so today we have 8,000 data sets that are put out by Singapore government. We are putting out some additional data sets, so by the end of this year we'll be at 10,000 data sets open. So this is something that we're working on. Not all are machine readable, we're trying to make that all machine readable. Standards, uh, we chatted a little bit at dinner last night. Lots of standards, the question is not whether we like standards, the question is which and how many. But we need to make sure that we're open to the world. So we don't want to build something which is a Singapore standard. We want to do things that are consistent with IEEE and global standards. The whole idea is in order to innovate, we need to be open, but we also want to contribute. So this is something we spend a lot of time on. Business innovation, 
This is something that my own team has done. I'll share it in 10 seconds. We looked at lots of small Singapore-based tech startups and said, why does government never buy anything from these little guys? And the simple answer is because if they're unknown, it feels risky. So my team put in place about a 25-person organization that goes through a deep dive, the hardware, the software, who are they, what are their financing profiles, and if they make it through, the little company makes it through that uh, due diligence, we say, they're for real, we put a little seal on them, and then government can buy with confidence because we've thrown ourselves on the hand grenade of that risk. And so we tried to make sure that Singapore government, we're also the chief information officer for government, so we've tried to make sure that our own people feel comfortable buying from small companies because we think that's where some great innovation can be unlocked. Uh, startups. This is a shot of one of the buildings that was a manufacturing site many, many years ago. It's been repurposed. It's a place full of lots of hopeful companies and aspiring companies. Uh, my own team has an investment arm that's based up there. So does the Singtel team have an investment arm that's based up there. So there's lots of great activity and lots of great opportunity for us to work together in this space especially because we are trying to challenge analytics teams, uh, spectrum management teams, IOT, battery power, all these things that go into making the vision that you've already heard about from prior speakers possible. We're trying to work on some of that here. And everybody and anybody in Australia that's got something that we can partner up with or explore together, fabulous. Like everybody, we put a lot of efforts into the accelerator. So when we see something, we pour petrol on it and try and make sure that it goes bigger and faster. And so we try and do that. And that's a group that we do a lot of work with in town. And we set up labs about a year and a half ago inside IDA. And it was basically an effort to say things are different. Although we are a government agency with 2,500 people, we try and act differently. So we tore down a bunch of offices, made it into a labs-oriented space with lots of prototyping equipment. We have a little drone testing area with nets where we can have kids that come in from local schools come in and hack up different drones. We show them how to We built some drones that the PM gave as uh, ceremonial gifts to some scientists that he had invited to Singapore that were built by 18 and 19 year olds and used different motion control and cool things. So we're trying to just show people that it's okay to experiment. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, doesn't matter. Learn from it. Inevitably, privacy is important. So when we've talked about this, people say, yes, but it feels very intrusive. How do I know you're not going to use this for the wrong way? And the answer is we just have to keep talking about it. So I do believe in what Minister said yesterday uh, in his television interview, which is there's a balance between knowing enough to keep people safe and do the right things to serve citizens and making sure that we don't go too far. So there is already a Personal Data Protection Act in Singapore that says what data can and cannot be used for. And so we are working hard to make sure that we're clear. But inevitably, this is just an ongoing, ongoing communication effort. That's what we're talking about. So we're trying to bring together startups, our research community. We put about $3 billion a year as Singapore into research. There's about another $3 billion a year that goes in from corporates. So that's a lot of R&D. And we're trying to do a better job tapping into that. So startups, research, universities. What we're trying to do is government to give a platform and something cohesive and then all the big corporates, all the big banks and everybody that treats Singapore as an Asia Pacific hub we want to tap into. And the whole idea is if we can unlock something from all of those different stakeholders, all of those different constituent parties, then we believe we can do something amazing. It's a common purpose that we're trying to work to because we have inevitable, important, unavoidable trends. And what we want to do is be leading, not reacting. And that's where we said, OK, let's aspire to do that under this flag of Smart Nation. Our prime minister's talked about it. The president of Singapore's talked about it. Importantly, we'd like to work with many of you in ways to unlock some of this creativity and to see Singapore as a test lab, if you will, in which we can explore and experiment. That's our goal. Thanks very much.